Hello, I'm Dr. Mark Andrew Holacek, coming to you from my hermitage in Lynchburg, and uh, Thomas Jefferson scholar, philosopher, and historian. And um, today I'd like to talk to you about Thomas Jefferson's University of Virginia, uh, the story of his commitment to education is seldom told and it's seldom understood in its full context. Jeffersonian Republicanism was essentially wedded to systemic educational reform. And the University of Virginia at some point in his life becomes part of that reform. So let's talk about that story. The title might uh, provisionally be University of Virginia, Circumstantially Southern, Scientifically American. Okay, when, when Jefferson retires from the presidency, well, during his presidency, I should say, he sit down, Jeff. He attempts to implement implement um, certain reforms um, to uh, facilitate the principles of uh, Jeffersonian Republicanism, which is small government, government of and by the people, through elected and recallable representatives, a government in which uh, all sorts of incentives for all people to flourish are, are, are put into place, uh, even though the government is supposed to, uh, it aims at um, foreign policy and securing human rights. Now, while he was president, he did what he could to make the country a Jeffersonian Republic. He inherited a substantial debt of $83 million. And by the second term, he reduces it, I think it's to 57 million, which is a substantial reduction. And he does that through removing, trimming the fat in government, um, cutting out inessential uh, agencies by reducing the size of the Navy. It's a, it's a time of, of non-war. Uh, that said, he deals with certain problems. Um, one is the uh, Tripolitan pirates. And instead of paying tribute to the pirates, which something other countries have been doing throughout the years, Jefferson goes to war. And the effect of that is, is so great that uh, there is a, a peace treaty signed in 1805. Now, in 1803, he, uh, as is commonly known, he uh, brings about the Louisiana Purchase. He purchases uh, the Louisiana Territory, thereby doubles the size of the United States, it, just like that. Um, in 1808, there is a law uh, prohibiting the importation of slaves. Uh, during the same year, there are the uh, Non-Importation and Embargo Acts, which are chiefly aimed at England and put into place in preference of going to war. As we know, these don't work out all that well. Uh, and they're rescinded during Madison's presidency. Um, Jefferson, when he retires, the idea, I suspect, is that he's going to go to Monticello and work on his plantation and uh, fix up the plots of land so that he can make money that way. But Jefferson was not all that. It wasn't part of his DNA to retire and to withdraw in such a way. He was a large-minded person. And uh, as Aristotle noted, it's appropriate for large-minded people, people with large capacities to engage in activities best suited to their nature. And so Jefferson um, eschews uh, being overseer of his plantation. Good boy, Jeff. Got my little buddy over here. And uh, he begins work at least uh, as early as 1814 on a higher education. Yeah. And eventually this work will turn into, will lead into uh, the steps towards birthing the University of Virginia. Uh, education was part of Jefferson's system, a part of Jefferson's uh, Jeffersonian Republicanism. Jefferson thought that there should be at the level of wards wards. Uh, each county would be broken up into a number of wards, and wards could be as small as six uh, by six uh, or ten by ten mile plots. And within each ward, there would uh, be a ward school applying, you know, set up by the public institution, set up by the, uh, the, the ward itself that allowed the 
citizens of that ward to have some degree of education, uh, reading, writing, arithmetic, and things like that, so that farmers could conduct their own affairs, right? Um, that was that. And then within each um, county, the wards were part of a county, and then within a county, there'd be a college or grammar school. And within the state, you know, comprising numerous counties, there would be um, uh, an institution of high of highest education, like the University of Virginia, centrally located in that. Now, this is not, you know, arbitrary, as we shall see. It's it's set up intentionally to mimic the sort of breakdown that we have in uh, what Jefferson ideally saw in the Jeffersonian Republic. You have the nation comprising states, states comprising counties, counties comprising ideally for Jefferson wards and so forth. And in the wards, you'd have the individual families and then individuals in the families, right? And the idea is this is the bottom-up generated system and uh, families and individuals would be robustly empowered during the system. Now, Jefferson talks of four bills. He tells in his autobiography that are... Uh, form a system in which he says every fiber would be eradicated of ancient and future aristocracy. He says these are the foundation laid for government truly Republican. The bills uh, concern riddance of entails and, uh, you know, a primogenitor, which keeps money within the same family. Um, and primogenitor obviously means the money goes to the firstborn, Jefferson. <laughs> Famously says when he talks about his autobiography that uh, he was against uh, primogenitor, you know, and thought uh, that uh, the money should be split up among all the offspring and so forth. But it's against entails and primogenitor is also pro freedom of religion, as I said earlier. It's not so much that uh, I think he was worried about religious toleration that the government uniquely. Republican, liberal, would tolerate discordant religions and should not be sponsoring any one particular religion like um, England has uh, was doing. And the early colonists were uh, uh, um, under the English uh, Anglicanism and so forth, and Jefferson, and, and, and the colonies were turning away from Anglicanism. So there was, uh, there was a lot of support for uh, freedom of religion in that sense. And the last one is systemic educational reform, which Jefferson uh, tried to do in an early bill in, late in the 17, uh, uh, 1770s. He gets, he's a part of the committee in 1776. And in 1786, I think, uh, his bill for religious freedom passes, but uh, his bill for systemic educational reform never does pass. He says to um, Wilson Carey Nicholas, my partiality, this is in 1816, my partiality for that division ward schools, colleges, and the university, i.e., is not founded on, in views of education solely, but infinitely more as the means of the better administration of our government and the eternal preservation of its Republican principles. So Jefferson is thwarted in the aim of having systemic educational reform of, of bringing in ward schools, creating wards and bringing wards in, in Virginia. Uh, the gentry don't want to pay for ward schools. Their kids are already getting privately educated. And of course, uh, if you're, you have a preference for private education, you're not going to want to introduce public education where you're going to have to pay twice. Your, your students will be privately, your own kids will be privately educated, and um, you'd be paying taxes that go to ward schools, the creation of ward schools and your own ward, uh, and so forth. So that never flew. So what did Jefferson do? He turned in his retirement years to constructing an institution of higher education, which morphed in time uh, to the University of Virginia. He talks of uh, creating uh, the institution he has in mind will be an academical village, to use his own words. And by that, he means it's going to be a sort of self-sufficient entity, right? Uh, it's going to be P-shaped. P is, the, uh, we call it pi, but the, the Greeks would pronounce it P, just like a, the, the Greek letter P. Hi, Jeff, you got to get into the 
to the show, right? And uh, in the middle, there would be the rotunda, uh, and at the top, and then on each of the arms, there would be five pavilions for uh, the house, the 10 professors, five on each side, five on the east, five on the west, and then there would be dormitory, dormitories for students between the pavilions. So it would be, you know, long P-shaped. And uh, with professors in the uh, uh, pavilions, and you know, ten professors that he uh, saw at least an immediate need for them, and um, he adds in the same letter to Nichols, uh, as the buildings I would strongly recommend to their consideration instead of one immense building, in other words, like William and Mary, to have a small one for every professorship arranged at proper distances around the square to admit extension. Connection by a piazza so that they may go drive from one school to another, right? The dorms and then, you know, the, the piazza that connects them so the students can walk in times of rain. This village form is preferable to a single great building for many reasons, particularly on kind of fire, health, economy, peace, and quiet. It's going to be constructed in the countryside, Charlottesville was the city at the time. Uh, it was out in the country. And so Jefferson thought, you know, this is a much healthier environment. Uh, they were worried about things like uh, yellow fever, plague, and things like that. Okay, now each pavilion would have its own unique neoclassical design. Uh, columns could be Ionian, uh, Doric, Corinthian, um, sit down, bud. And um, he writes again to Nicholas, the small buildings will afford uh, of exhibiting models of an architecture of the purest forms of antiquity, furnishing to the students examples of the precepts he will be taught in that art. So the idea is students and even professors while going to and from their classes could marvel in the square in that large a parcel of grass or land between the, the pavilions, on, between the charms in the middle of the, the P, they could sit and marvel at the wonderful architectural designs of the building and they could learn architecture. Jefferson, as uh, I've noted, and other professors, um, Richard Guy Wilson, for example, um, architectural, retired architectural historian at UVA, talked about uh, Jefferson being alone responsible for bringing neoclassicism to the United States. So all those buildings you see uh, in neoclassical design, we have the, the museum at uh, Lynchburg, for example, used to be the courthouse, um, that is neoclassical in design. And Jefferson brought that to the United States. Sit down, buddy. Okay, um, of the curriculum, he writes to John Adams in 1814, I hope the necessity will at length be seen of establishing institutions here as in Europe where every branch of science useful at this day may be taught in its highest degree, right? Um, he writes to Joseph Cavill in 1820, the greatest good requires that while they are instructed in general, competently to the common business of life, in other words, general education, others should employ their genius with the necessary information to the useful arts, to inventions for saving labor and in increasing our comforts, to nursing our health, to civil government, military science, and so on. So there's going to be, you know, he's talking about you know, systemic educational form, but in the last case, he's talking about having an institution where the men of greatest virtue and genius could go and um, study things that are of utmost importance to uh, civil liberty, uh, utmost importance to humans flourishing within their wards and their counties and their state and in their country. Okay, to Destat de Tracy. It was the foremost ideologist of his day, a philosopher, Jefferson writes in 1820, uh, that this institution will be of my native state, the hobby of my old age. In other words, a gift to his beloved Virginians by himself. He says, our aim is the securing to our country a full and perpetual institution for all the useful sciences, one which will restore us, by us he means either Virginia or the South, to our former station in the Confederacy. Okay, now what's he talking about? Well, at the time, there is Harvard University, the oldest uh, institution in the country. 
There's Yale, and Connecticut. There's the University, what, what is now the University of Pennsylvania. These are all schools in Federalist territory, and Jefferson's worry is that they're teaching the principles of federalism, thick government, strong government, uh, banks, paper, <laughs> all the things that Jefferson finds uh, uniquely abhorrent, right? Um, to uh, Breckinridge, he writes in an earlier letter to George Breckinridge, uh, in 1821, he says the refraction, this is a long passage, so bear with me, but it's a fruitful passage. Sit down, buddy. The reflections that the boys of this age are to be the men of the next, that they should be prepared to receive the holy charge which we are cherishing to deliver over to them, that in, in establishing an institution of wisdom for them, we secure it to all our future generations, that in fulfilling this duty, we bring home to our own bosoms the sweet consolation of seeing our sons rising under the luminous tuition to destinies of high promise. Beautiful language, by the way. These are considerations which will occur to all, but I fear I do not see the speck in our horizon, which is to burst on us like a tornado sooner or later. What's he talking about? He expands. The line of division lately marked out between different portions of our Confederacy is such as will never, I fear, be obliterated. And we are now trusting to those who are against us in position and principle to fashion their own form of minds and affections of our youth. If has, ha, has been estimated, we send $300,000 a year to the Northern seminaries for the instruction of our own sons, that we must have their 500 of our sons imbibing opinions and principles in discord with those of the country. People going to those northern institutions are not learning liberal principles of, of government, right? They're not breathing pure, free, liberal air. He says, this canker is eating on the vitals of our existence, and if not arrested at once, will be beyond remedy. We are now certainly furnishing recruits to their school. So we're taking our southern young men, putting them in northern schools where they're learning how to be federalists, and that's Jefferson's concern. Okay, this leads us to consideration of why he's creating the University of Virginia. It's not just something to pass the time. As I stated before, during his tenure as president, he did what he could to implement uh, the principles of Jeffersonian republicanism, to, to have a thin government, to have a government responsible for the, uh, securing the rights of the citizenry, uh, to minimize the influence of government on citizens' affairs so they can lead their own lives, right? Um, so the University of Virginia is, in effect, a, a tonic or, as it were, um, Catholicon to the sort of education one might expect to get in the northern schools, the Yales and the Harvards and things like that. He writes to William Giles in 1825, not too far from the year of his death, I fear not to say that within 12 or 15 years from this time, a majority of the rulers of our state will have been educated here. They shall carry hence the correct principles of our day, and you may count, um, and you may count assuredly that they will exhibit their country in a degree of sound respectability, it has never known either in our day or those of our forefathers, right? So the, the University of Virginia is going to, to be an institution based on liberalism, based on Jeffersonian liberal principles of correct government. And uh, he wants Virginians and Southerners, by the way, to come, and even Northerners invite them to come down and, and be educated, get a Southern education. Uh, he writes to Augustus B. Woodward in April 1825, I'm closing the last scenes of my life by fashioning and fostering an establishment for the destruction of those who are to come after us. I hope its influence on their virtue, their freedom, their uh, fame and happiness will be salutary and permanent. So it's going to be a bastion for liberal principles of government. The notion of education, education was not a hobby horse or a pastime for Jefferson. 
It was essential, as I say in my book on Jefferson's philosophy of education. Um, it would fit like education and politics fit together like glove in hand. Uh, that was the, the need. Uh, a, a properly robust government, one that answers to the needs of the citizenry, cannot flourish without there being educational reform at all levels, at the lower level, so all the people can handle their own affairs, and at the higher level, so that the pe people with the utmost virtue and, and genius can um, get involved in governing. The people that are probably least you know, inclined to govern will govern and keep in mind the benefit of the citizenry. So um, what Jefferson has in mind is to model the University of Virginia after his model of what a liberal government should look like, you know. And, you know, at, in, in the Jeffersonian Republic, there's the federal government, which attends to uh, foreign affairs as well as uh, securing the rights of the citizens. And it does, in some sense, intrude upon the citizens as well uh, uh, in allowing for things like uh, interstate transport by building roads and clearing out rivers and things like that so there can be better communication and things. But for the most part, you have the federal government, then you have the state governments, and the state governments uh, are uh, empowered to do anything that's not given explicit constitutional warrant, right? Federal government can only do what the Constitution allows it explicitly to do. The state governments and then the states, you have the the county governments and then ward governments. And so the University of Virginia, in some sense, is going to be modeled like that, allowing its citizens, its students to have the utmost freedom in their education, as well as the, the professors there. Okay, Jefferson did not want there to be a president. There was no president uh, at the University of Virginia. I think it was till 1900. I'm not sure of that date. But there was to be no president. You know, and you compare that to Jefferson's execration of autocratic government. Students, as I noted before, would be in, in the P, would be, you know, housed in residences between the pavilions. And what he has in mind that uh, to be uh, interaction at uh, outside of the classroom between professors and students in the manner that Jefferson uh, used to hang around George Wythe, who was the foremost lawyer in Virginia at the time, the governor of Fauquier, and Professor William Small, professor of philosophy and mathematics. Jefferson would hang around with these guys, and he wanted students to be able to have access to their professors, uh, intimate access, as, as it were, you know, outside of the classroom. Um, now, um, if that might be compared politically to Jefferson's insistence that, so this interaction here, Jefferson also insisted in his political schema that all persons would be involved in participating in political matters insofar as their talents and their virtue, not talents and their uh, uh, time, I should say, allows, okay? Now, the most significant liberal, uh, oh, I should say, there's another thing, when, uh, Miscreant behavior by students would be addressed by a panel of students, not a panel of professors, or by the visitors. So Jefferson wanted, and this is comparable to Jefferson for all de facto cases of trials, that Jefferson wanted a trial by jury, not a trial by judge, because he thought that a trial by judge was like cross and pile, was like it, it was arbitrary. He wanted to make sure there was a possibility of great, of great corruption depending upon the political leanings of the judge, it's better to have a jury of one's peer. Now, the greatest liberal reform Jefferson uh, implemented at University of Virginia was uh, elective education. And that was not had at Harvard or Yale or University of Pennsylvania at the time. Uh, he writes to George Tickner, uh, the, there will be no set curriculum. The holding the students to all to one prescribed course of reading and disallowing exclusive application of those branches only which are to qualify them for the particular vocations to which they are destined. Right. So we're not going to have we're not going to have students uh, all students following the same set curriculum. The needs of students are unique. We need to have a, an education that allows students to study and focus on those things that'll be of 
greatest importance to them, right? And this is a, a, a significant, significant innovation. Now he continues to Tickner, we shall on the contrary allow them uncontrolled choice in the lectures they shall choose to attend and acquire elementary qualification only in sufficient age. Our institution will proceed on the principle of doing all the good it can without consulting its own pride or ambition of letting everyone come and listen to whatever he thinks. He's always got to be in the camera. May improve the condition of his mind. So elective education is tremendously important. And that's the aim here. Utmost freedom at the institution. Um, now, the aim, as I'm trying to argue in this talk, is not modest here. Jefferson wants the education is the institution, the University of Virginia, is politically significant. It's going to teach the principles of Jeffersonian liberalism, Jeffersonian republicanism. Um, he writes to George Tickner again in 1823, our views are Catholic, broad for the improvement of our country by science. So here there's a sort of universal, it's not just a Southern or Virginian institution, it's an institution aimed at improving, um, moved up, aimed at improving the country, bringing back the country to its uh, liberal sensibilities, right? Um, he writes to Thomas Cooper in 1820, I contemplate the University of Virginia as the future bulwark of the human mind in this hemisphere. Right, so it's hemispheric in significance, not just uh, for uh, uh, you know hemisphere, half the sphere. He's talking about North and South America. It's going to be the leading institution. So he's at least in, and Thomas Cooper is a very intimate friend, a very intelligent man whom he wanted to employ as one professor at University of Virginia, but that didn't go through because he was, Cooper was a Unitarian and an outspoken, um, uh, a, a, a outspoken philosopher when it came to religion, and he offended many people and made many enemies that way. But, you know, we take this seriously because he's writing to an intimate to be sharing his innermost secrets. It's going to be uh, hemispheric in its significance, good boy. Okay, now, Talk, go back to the professorships, there are 10 for various subjects. He talked five on each arm of the, uh, of the P. Uh, he says to William Short in 1819, either the ablest which America or Europe can furnish or none at all. He's talking about the professors. They'll give us the selected, uh, they'll give us the selected society of a great city, right? Uh, uh, separated from the dissipations and levities of its ephemeral insects. Even the language is, is extraordinary there. All right, Jeff, I know you want to get the camera. You got to sit down. All right. Um, so he wants the best. And if that means he has to go to Europe, and he does go to Europe to get the professors that he wants um, uh, to, to begin the University of Virginia, he will go to Europe if he has to, and he does. To Joseph. Uh, C. Cabell, who's a senator, Jefferson talks of the institution being, um, of the professors being well-rounded uh, 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 pundits, as it were. So says in 1824, a man is not qualified for a professor knowing nothing but merely his own profession. He should be otherwise well-educated as to the science generally, able to converse understandingly with the scientific men with whom he is associated, and to assist in the councils of the faculty on the subject of science on which they may have occasion to deliberate. Without this, he will incur their contempt and bring disreputation to the institution. All the professors need to be well-rounded, to be able to converse on a multiplicity of subjects. Uh, that was the understanding of intelligence in Jefferson's mind. And that, that's how Jefferson was, and he expected his professors to be the same. Notice how different that is with our educational institutes. They specialize, 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 right? And you find people that are, are good in their inner specialization, but they don't understand the big picture. And there's a wonderful quote from Ludwig Wittgenstein, who's talking about the appreciation for a work of art. And he says, imagine someone coming up to a painting, he does this, he goes, you know, he's looking at it. And, 
he uh, sipped it. He's looking at it, you know, very, very, from a very close distance. And at some point he says, I just don't get it. Well, <laughs> Wittgenstein's point, of course, is obviously that a, a work of art is expected to be appreciated at a certain distance. In the same way that a professor should should be should be able to approach his own subject from a certain distance and see how it relates to others. And if you can't do that, uh, don't call him an educated um, person. Now, all the professors will be at liberty to choose their own text. Uh, so that's the sort of freedom that the professors have. And uh, what was Jeff? Um, with the exception of the professor of law, and Jefferson says to Cartwright that in 1824, that no, these books are going to be selected in advance for the professor of law, because the problem is they, they need to be texts that uh, inculcate the principles of liberty, right? Uh, we want to avoid uh, uh, books that are federalist, that talk of suffocating government or monarchy and things like that. So we're going to pick these books. So to end this, um, one might say what I'm trying to show is that University of Virginia was a uniquely, was said to be a singularly Southern institution, uh, maybe a Virginian institution, but in practice, Jefferson thought it was, um, it was uh, hemispheric in its, and perhaps global, was to be global in its significance. Uh, so that's hence the title of my uh, talk is that it talked about the institution being circumstantially, in other words, accidentally Southern, but scientifically. Uh, scientia in, in Latin means knowledge. So that's the, in terms of the amount of knowledge and in terms of what students would learn, it's going to be a, a universal or Catholic in its significance. I hope you enjoyed this talk. And uh, TTFN, about time for now, we'll do it again sometime. Get my cat in the background as well, trying to hog some of the spotlight. Talk to you later.